the Firefish Software Crowdcast. Um, I'm your host, Cameron McLennan, and joining me today, I'm very fortunate to have um, Helen Haddon and John Hi. Rhodes. Um, just before we go ahead and we uh, we kick off with the questions, guys, just for the, the benefit of the people that have joined us uh, live today, could you go ahead and tell um, the people that are viewing just a little bit of background about, um, about each of you? And we'll start off with, with Helen. Sure. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I have been working in uh, recruitment, mostly in um, in search and in operational level for the last uh, 20 years. Um, and when uh, I've been consulting to recruitment businesses in the last three years, um, and when the GDPR came up, I realized this is going to be a really big issue. So um, I've spent time concentrating on how to make that a lot easier for, for businesses through my company, Comply GDPR. So my background is completely in, um, in recruitment. I understand the issues that people are facing, and we're dealing that with a lot of clients at the moment. So really into the issues. Great. Fantastic. And John? Well, welcome everyone. John Rose. I'm over here in sunny Canada at the moment, about minus two degrees, so I'm oh, enjoying wow. myself. A project that's quite related to what we're going to be talking about. We've got a startup group that's moving into Europe. And one of the concerns was are they the you know security compliance, data compliant in the area? So the the GDPR is quite relevant for them because they're going to be going across the whole of of Europe into the different countries. So that's going to be something I'm working with. So, so I'm doing it hands-on, down in the weeds and down in the mud, trying to work out exactly how to get things done. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, GDPR is something that everyone is really, really um, focused in on at the moment as, as May, May quickly gets closer and closer. Should GDPR be something that everyone in the recruitment industry takes note of, and that should it be something that everyone everyone cares about? Hello, new definitely. <laughs> um, uh, well, definitely. Um, I mean, it's it's a regulation which is coming into law, so basically people need to sit up and take notice. And I think for quite a while people have been trying to ignore it, hoping it will go away, but it's definitely coming. Um, I think in the UK they're sitting um, in Parliament in the next couple of weeks to incorporate into UK law. So from 25th of May, it's going to be something you need to take notice of. Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and address just a couple of the questions that are coming through just now as well. Then, sure. so um, David Cox asks, do we have to do we have to request consent from contacts to hold their data, or will it just apply to candidates' personal data? Okay. So um, this is kind of what I would call one of the, one of the myths as well that you have to have consent to hold everybody's data. You don't have to have consent because consent is one of um, six reasons. Um, so what's called legal basis for holding your data. So I um, saw so, so Damien's just popped up a question saying legitimate interests. So that is also possible, as well as contractual reasons why you'd need to hold data. So what you need to go back to is basically you need to start off with a a policy, which is around your legal basis for holding data. And that might be you might use consent, you might use legitimate interest, you might use a mix of those things, but you need to understand what your reason is and you need to be able to demonstrate that as well. Yeah. So I'm not sure that that answered the question, but no. it's, it's, not, it's not as clear cut as you have to have consent from everybody to hold their data. Okay, that, you, you, yeah, that's really good, Helen. I mean, Monica just came in there and said, do you need consent for using the data, though, as opposed to just holding it? Well, I think another thing that people get confused about is, is permission and consent, because obviously if you take somebody's data from a job board, it would be polite to say to them, actually, we are using your data and we'd like to put you forward to this, this role, all right? Yeah. Um, oh, we've got a different background with John now. Um, I think sometimes people use the word consent when they're actually meaning permission, but because in the, in the English language, you use them interchangeably, it's a different thing having a legal consent with a capital C than asking somebody, is it okay for me to have your data and to put you forward for this role? Okay. They're two different things, Great. if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect. That's brilliant. And um, <laughs> just another question that's come in there um, from uh, Nicole. She's asking, how long can we keep candidates' data on our database for? Some articles that she's read say six months when they request the right <laughs> to be forgotten. Do we delete the entire record off the CRM? And how do we keep audit trail? 
Right. Okay. There's about four or five questions there. So, <laughs> so let's start with um, how long can you keep somebody's data? Okay. What the GDPR actually says is you must you mustn't keep data longer than is necessary, and you mustn't keep data that's out of date. Okay. That's all it says. It doesn't give any timelines at all. So this comes back to your own policy, and you have to decide and to be able to demonstrate why you've, give, you've made that your policy, why you're keeping certain data for certain amount of times. And you've got to demonstrate that you're trying to keep it accurate, up to date. So there's a couple of kind of spinning plates that you have to, to kind of balance there. Um, so there is actually no rule. And I don't know where people get these rules from, but they're certainly not from the GDPR. Yeah. So that was one of the questions. Yep. <laughs> um, just refresh me on so, the second part yeah, of this. So, then, um, so how long can we keep data on a database for? Some article six months. Well, when they request the right to be forgotten, do we delete their entire record off of our CRM? And how do we keep an audit trail? Right. OK. Um, so if they ask, ask to be forgotten, yes, you have to delete their record and you have to get rid of the data you've got yep. however i think again people get confused about this because they think it's a kind of a right never to be found again or never to be kind of remembered so actually what you what it seems as if you can do is keep a very very minimal record mm -hmm. to say this person has asked to be forgotten and that you don't contact them again so that should that should be okay so the right to be forgotten is not a right never ever to be contacted contacted again it's a retrospective everything up to this day you should get rid of and obviously if a candidate has said i don't want you to have my data you, they obviously don't want to deal with you again in the future so it's just as well not to yeah. annoy them by doing that brilliant great and um so another one there that we got um from nicole was that she's launching a new website just now which means that anyone who mm -hmm. has an account um will lose their current account once the new site goes live. She's wondering about, is it okay to then go ahead and email those users with an account to let them know this and that they will need to create, or will they need to create a new account for job alerts, et cetera? Is John back? I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Great, yeah, I can hear you, John. Oh, good, good. Well, I've got Have in a slightly purple padded silent room, so hopefully this will be a little bit better. <laughs> Yeah, did you catch away. a flight back to Did you catch a flight back to the UK where the broadband worked? <laughs> yeah, I, tell you what, I, wish, I wish I had the, the bandwidth. Yeah, I won't swear on it. It's live, so I'm very tempted. I, I think it's, it's and I caught the end of the question. Then the good one is, is what we're looking at is what is fair and reasonable for these individuals. If you do a new database and all your data is being held on your database on the cloud service, you've really got to look at what is the policy of the, the hosting service, what's their policy in terms of data and data security, because you've got to look at risk. As a simple business, if you've got people who've already registered with you, registered with on your by your website, what a great touch point, what a great updating way of connecting with them and sending a message out saying, hey, we've got a new website and we want to make sure that everything is current, everything is up to date. So can you just help us out by doing this? And also sharing with your friends and colleagues and associates about our new website, our new process. So much yeah. it shows respect for people, it shows integrity, and it stands you out above the others that are just doing whatever they're continuing doing from 20 years ago. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and it's, it's one of the things that, that are going to benefit the benefit the recruitment sector. If you are running an agency and you're going through a rebrand and you're getting a new website put together or whatever, you know, it gives you a reason to go ahead and contact people and contact candidates mm -hmm. and make them aware that there's this new legislation coming into place. Because the recruitment sector at the moment is all over this. Everybody's talking about it, but every candidate walking about the street and, you know, speaking to their mates in the pub on a Friday about a new job, they're not sitting in the background going, mm, you know, what's going on with GDPR? It's, it's the recruitment agencies that need to be aware of it just now. And it will start to come to light more and more when the, the um when the like reg, reg, the regulations kick, come into force in May. But it kind of puts you ahead, I think, of the Yeah, with the, like I say, the candidates are the ones at the moment that are, are in the dark because yes. nothing going out in the press, the, the, the agencies, job boards, no one is really promoting out to them and letting them know that you know, this is coming, they need to be aware of this. You know, the, 
you've got Facebook, you've got, I saw Shane's question earlier, which was, which is quite a, which is a good one as well. We'll pick up on that. But, and, and I think the contractors, the contractor market is probably going to be the first ones that react to GDPR for, for agencies and how we handle their data. And, and we've got two issues there. You've got the legal compliance for payroll, for accounting aspect of work, but you've also got the, the human aspect of data as well so this will lead more and more contractors to become sole traders sole proprietors you know incorporated limited companies because then you're only going to hold company data but you still going to load a minimum amount of personal data which is you know low risk and, and low um, specific detailed information on that individual. You're basically going to have a name, you know, yeah. affiliated yeah. to this company, and that's it. And that's all you're going to have. You're not going to have to get a bill or any other personal high-risk data. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that from that side of it, I think that... It gives it gives recruiters an opportunity. Give recruiters give opportunity an opportunity for recruiters to add more value to their candidates. You're going to need to be consistently valuable to the people that are inside your database for them to want to stay there and be part of it. And that's only a good thing if you're going to give candidates what they want when they want it and not get caught up in, um, you know, spam and irrelevant information to people. That's what the whole legislation is here to here to um, prevent. So, the good recruiters will continue to get better as a result of this, I believe, rather than it be a, a negative. Yeah, yeah I, th I think engagement, I think there's going to be, it's going back a little bit more to kind of the, you know, pre-internet days when there's just more engagement with people, um, actually please, please say that communicating. Back to a filing cabinet. <laughs> and roller decks of calling people. But there again, that's going to yeah. be quite an interesting conundrum as well with the with, with the paper data side of things, which comes into yeah, of course. personal information protection. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Here's here's one job with you being based in Canada. There's a few uh, at the moment. There's a few kind of myths going around about that as well. So if you're based in Canada and you are uh, recruiting talent inside Europe. Will GDPR apply to you? The, the the rule is very clear, very simple. If you are getting data, personal data from individuals within Europe who are resident permanently or even temporary resident in, in Europe, you, irrespective of which country you are sourcing from, you are responsible and liable under GDPR regulations. And they have got reciprocal agreements across I believe it's the WTO they've actually gone through and then they've got most of the, uh, I'm going to say, technology world that's, that's involved. They're, they're, they've signed up for it, so a fine is a fine, a punishment is a punishment, and they can track you down and chase you wherever you want. Yeah. It's also got, and really when you think, you know, like Australia and Canada and Germany, it's, um, I've already got ahead of the legislation for pri personal privacy. Peter and Castle over here in Canada. The US is state by state, but the rules still apply there. So if you're sat down in that like, team down in San Francisco, and I say to them, if you're going to go into Europe after people, then you've got to make sure that everything is compliant and, and is, is obeying those rules and not just the San Francisco, the California rules. Yep. Because at the moment they have their own set of rules like each state does in the US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Helen, if, if you're if you're speaking to people that are storing data in all sorts of different places, um, some may have some yes. data in their content management system for their website. They might have yeah. an Excel spreadsheet. They might have uh, uh, email. Um, they might have email. Uh, they might have yeah. mobile phone text messages uh, storing data everywhere. Um, what yeah. sort of practical advice would you give to someone if they if that's how they're storing data? <laughs> Well, I think you know one of the things you need to start off doing is is looking at where all the different places you are keeping data. And I think once companies start doing that, they realise quite how how widespread it is. One of the things that we we run for our clients is something we call a data amnesty, mm -hmm. um, where we kind of do it anonymously and ask um, ask the individuals in the business you know, where you actually keeping keeping data because quite often what the 
business thinks is happening is quite different to what's happening in reality. So it's a really good reason to try and minimize the amount of data that you've, you've got in all the different places so that you can find it when you need it. Because if you've ever had to deal with a kind of data subject access request, which we have still got under the current Data Protection Act, it can be an absolute nightmare to try and find all of the data that you need yep. um, when it's spread all over the place. So it's a really good reason to, to kind of pare that down and, and look at your working practices. And also just in terms of security, it's a lot better as well if you have, if you have things in you know, centralized places. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and I, I agree that's going to be key. And the other side of it as well is we know over the last couple of years there's been a proliferation of, of tools, Chrome extension, and apps that help in terms of inbound, outbound marketing, sharing messages, and spreading the word about the opportunities, your company. One of the things to look at, and, and this is it, this is part of the, the, the what I call a data mapping exercise, where you get someone to go out and just walk around and say, "Let's have a look at your computer and see where everything is." And do that. There's this, you know, if t, so you know, if this, then that. Great application. It's a great tool for for sharing collaboration. But you may have completely set up that it's storing data into Google Spreadsheets, Google Sheets mm -hmm. that you don't realise. So, so it's also starting to think out the box of where people might have stored or be putting records of data that can be linked back and going forwards. So it's not just the, the traditional and what we look at, the email services, everyone yeah. looking, you know, knows that there's going to really crash their out because we've got two gig of data in there that's been stored mm -hmm. over you know, 15 years or... Yeah. You know, Biggest filing cabinet. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we tell you everyone's got lots of notes still. Yeah. I'd hate to think I was going to do that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Qu quite a lot of people, just noticed Stefan's comment on the side there, quite a lot of people are worried about um, having to change up the way that they source. Um, Stefan's asking, like, what about using LinkedIn? Can we download their data freely or do we need their consent? Well, you don't need to change the way that you source um, at all. But it's what you do with that information once you get it. So, what advice would you give to to, to Stefan about how he's sourcing at the moment? Carry on, do, carry on doing what you're doing. Again, but just think about once you pull information from a public domain source or a paid domain source, such as a job bank database that you've paid access to, they're 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 hosting that data. The minute you copy it and download it onto your system, you're then liable. You're then exactly. responsible. As, yeah. as the data manager for that data. So it's mm -hmm. the same on LinkedIn, same on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. As soon as you pull it off the platform and put it onto your isolated system, then you are responsible for the accuracy, the relevance, the upkeep, all the components that make up with it. So that's what you've got to do is, is the sourcing side of it is not changing. It's what you do with the data once you've sourced it. So yeah. To follow on with that, then once they do source someone from LinkedIn, for example, they find someone and they do move it into their own data source, what should they do at that moment in time to um, make sure they're sticking to GDPR? Yeah. Well, the, f the first step is contact the people. Don't leave it, don't, don't do a my data mining exercise and get a thousand or fifteen hundred names and just store it all down into your CRM or into your mm -hmm. database or into my, wherever. You've got to pull them down. In the sources are going to are doing now more of a pre-pipeline building screening and reaching out and connecting with, with people and saying, hey, got your information from LinkedIn, we're exploring opportunities in X, Y, Z, A, B, C. They're going to have to give more information to the people if they want them to be part of their data set and part of that company's information, that source's pipeline. Yeah. Or yeah. they're just going to say, oh, thanks, that's it. So you just delete them and get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. So just on LinkedIn, I think Wendy's also highlighted there's something particular around LinkedIn, which is the LinkedIn user terms. So you just need to be really careful about that because if you're using your um, – your login to take information from LinkedIn, then actually you are breaking user user terms, um, LinkedIn user terms when you're taking personal information. So just be clear, that's not a GDPR issue, that's a LinkedIn um, user agreement issue. So just be aware of that. Yeah, I think um, yeah. So, so it's also a data privacy because they you've signed up to LinkedIn to say that you won't use it for those activities. 
Exactly. And you're contravening, contravening. So, like everything else, you know, one small mistake can cause mm. bigger troubles and bigger ramifications down the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, like, yeah. I think all, all that does when you're sourcing from various different sources is it makes sure that you're actually going to give the candidate a better level, level of service as well, because you've got their data. You want to have a conversation with them about how you can actually add value to them and possibly find them a new a new career. You know, if they're not interested and they don't want you to um, to to do anything uh, with them, then then I, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're um, Actually, what I'm going to do is, I know there's just loads of questions flying in here again, so I'm actually <laughs> going to address some of these before I continue with my own, because um, there's a few in here. So, yeah, let's have a look. So, um, so sorry, guys. Lots there's so questions. many questions coming through just now. Um, so, uh, Jacob Madsen's asked, I would, this is quite a long question as well. Uh, I would like to know about the subject of right to no reason for rejecting stroke insight, meaning a candidate can raise an SAR and demand and an agency is obliged to provide not only an answer, but equally provide documentation for the answer. Right, so, so we're talking about subject access, data subject access requests. Yep. Is it a question around what, what have you got to provide? Yeah, so it's the right to no reason for rejecting a candidate. So if a candidate comes in and asks, they, gives you an SAR for, like, why have you rejected me? Um, right, okay. So, so, so technically... Um, a person has the whole thing about the GDPR is a human rights piece of re regulation. So it's it's saying that you an individual has the right to know what's happening with their data and what people are holding on them. So you have the right to ask anybody, what are you holding on me? So if somebody asks you, you know, for a particular piece of information, then you have to give that to them. So what you can't do in doing that is um, reveal information that belongs to somebody else. So say, for example, um, you have a reference from somebody or, you know, John said that Helen is da-da-da-da. You would have to, re to delete John's name and anything that would lead to John's own privacy being um given out so it's a little bit complicated because sometimes the way that data is kind of linked together in in crms um but essentially if people have the right to see everything so people need to think about what are you actually storing what are you writing and are you going to be happy for someone to see that and that's not to say you should stop doing what you should doing but you should be mindful about somebody might be seeing that yeah so uh, you, I think, I think to, to add on to what alan said and i'm going to use the the pipeline rule over in canada which was probably is very similar to what GDPR is going to is GDPR to more teeth. One of the things that we were advised when they first implemented over here was exactly what Helen said: be careful what you write or how you write it. So if a person has got a bad reference, you don't put down that John said Helen is not a rubbish, never hire her. You put down saying you got a reference of negative value. Yeah. Mm. So you put something that's this you know, and you don't you never name the person that provided that information. You don't include that in your electronic records. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's the electronic records that's important. So again, the, the challenge will come is when some challenges on the paper side of records, which will come at some stage because people are going to be sneaking and say, I'm just going to write everything down on a piece of paper. There's nothing electronic. Then that's when an audit then comes in and they can then audit both the electronic mm. and the paper records related yeah. to that individual. Yeah, because because when they ask, it's not just the electronic records; it's everything that you have. So it might be emails, it might be paper, it might be a note, but it's it's got anything that's kind of in a system. And there's something called a temp test. So if you can explain to a temp quite quickly how to find information, then it's a system. All right. So people kind of cut off and say, well, you know, if I kind of like have this like weird filing system, if you can explain it to somebody, it's a filing system, and then it, it means you have to give it to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. So there seems to be quite a bit of confusion about the uh, consent. Yeah, and also the yeah, the, and also the yeah. Let's tackle that first as, as well. So, so there seems to be a bit of confusion about registering new candidates, sourcing them, bringing them into the database, and then getting consent. What what does consent look like? <laughs> How long is a piece of string on that one? I think, it's, think to mind, it's explicit. And I think the word explicit is, is going to be key to everyone understanding what consent means. 
you cannot use broad brush like we used to do, um, or that, and that still happens today, at the moment before the regulations come in, where you just turn around and say, I've got a job uh, in, in wantage. Are you interested? That is not explicit consent. That is not even consent in the eyes of the legislation. You've got to be more specific and more targeted, and even to the point that the consent has got to be with full awareness and full knowledge. So yeah. you can't hide behind other clients and say, well, the client said, I can't tell you. Then I'm then I've not given you consent. That's not going to do you any favours. So your business practice has got to change of giving more information. Yeah. So I, I agree with that. It's going to be, uh, but the other thing is going to be freely given. So uh, that's that's quite a difficult condition because obviously, if you're saying to somebody, um, you know, say for example, when somebody's registering with you before an interview, um, and you give them a form and says, "I need your consent before I interview you." then it's not freely given because actually you're kind of making them do it. Yeah. So th th this is why lawyers sometimes, uh, said, well, if, you know, if you had a number of lawyers on this, there would be lots and lots of discussion about, you know, what's right. So, some lawyers say you should only ever do consent. Other lawyers say you should only ever use legitimate interest. Right. And, and there's a big, big argument about it. The thing is in the GDPR, both are equally valid. Isn't One isn't better than another. But what you need to have is a documentation and a policy that demonstrates what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then you need to be able to demonstrate you're living by it. All right. So if you are taking consent from people, make sure you are doing that. All right. And you're doing it in a way that's, that seems to comply. If you're using legitimate interest, then again, demonstrate what you're doing and, and live by that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I know that there's a lot of discussion and I hear a lot of things saying you can only ever hold people's data by consent. And if you look at the ICO blog, they have a blog around this, which, which is specifically saying this is one of the myths that's surrounding the GDPR. You do not have to have everybody's consent. Right. So I recommend you, you read that blog because it's a really, really interesting blog. Okay. Okay. Um, what about candidates who, uh, sorry, what about candidates who we would not use again as they have let us down in the past? We need to know who they are, who they are going forward. Can we do this? Um, well, yeah, because what you're doing though, the, the question is saying is someone we've identified someone within our database, someone's information who we don't want to use again. You have two choices there. If they've actually worked for you and you've placed them somewhere and it didn't work out, so you don't want to ever place them with any more of your clients, you've legally got to keep the records for seven years anyway. Yeah. So, so, so you can keep it as a paper trail and remove them digitally. The problem with that is, if you then apply for another job and there's no record, so you've got to document it, but be prepared to, no names and no foul, and you, you turn around and you don't say the reason why they can't go. You're just going to put down some some um, wording that says not suitable for certain activities or certain opportunities. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's no, this is a perfectly good reason for recording factual information. I think, you know, if, some, if somebody has not turned up for an interview, you know, that's indisputable. It didn't turn up. Yeah. So I think it's when you start getting into subjective things, you start falling into problems. And that's not really around the GDPR. That's just around your own liability that people might then start looking if they, they receive that information and then they want to start making trouble around it. Um, it's just better to stick to facts. So, you know, I think that's absolutely fine to say they didn't turn up. Yeah. I um, just got a question coming in from Tommy Gale there saying um, they get everyone currently as it stands at the moment to agree to their uh, data protection policy before they can apply. Um, can you recommend what should be included in the policy? <laughs> You've got That would be... Yeah. That would be <laughs> quite, how long have we got? Yeah. <laughs> like a 17 page uh, document on this. And it's, again, yeah. I think the law, the, the, the rule is very going to be, in, we used to call it plain English. It doesn't need yeah. a law degree. It's someone who has graduated from secondary school with an education level at that level. You know, or in, in North America, we call it grade 12 education. Mm -hmm. Is the language of the document such that that person of that level of education can understand and comprehend and walk away in full awareness? 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so um, Tom's asking, is verbal permission acceptable or must it be in writing or you must have an audit trail proof? So um, verbal consent is um, is possible. Um, the the issue around verbal consent is that you'd need to. So I heard the ICA talking this the other day, and they said that it's preferable if you can prove that you've read somebody a script. So it's quite, you know, you don't really want to be you know, like, in, you know, went to like the small print just by a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, you know, read this about a great thing out to somebody. Yeah. So um, yes, it is possible. Um, it is possibly open to abuse. So perhaps, you know, from a risk perspective, you may want to not use verbal consent, yeah. but. It is certainly possible, but I think you need to look at the mechanism of doing that and a way of properly recording it and perhaps a script as well. Yeah. I think from our point of view, because the um, our product sits on the um, integrates with their, the, our clients' websites, that if people are driving them towards the registration registration mm -hmm. workflow and they can ask them for consent at that moment in time, you have an electronic audit trail of, okay, this person came in on this date and time, they gave us, you know, they, they agreed to our candidate declaration, et cetera. That's through, you have an audit trail there then to prove that. Um, so yeah. quite a lot of people I know are starting to drive people towards a registration on their website where the data then pulls through into the CRM system and you mm -hmm. have everything. Yeah link there so you've got that audit trail so might be worth uh, yeah. might be worth considering Tom and I know Helen you've got a toolkit as well don't you um, uh -huh. in terms I do. Of that, so it might be worthwhile um, with that one for, for Tom cool so a yeah. um, couple more questions so um, <laughs> this next question <laughs> are there any simple steps towards GTBR compliance that agencies could start doing now no, okay. number one know where you, all your data is stored no way. Do your talent map, your, your data map first, where, where everything goes, because you need to have somewhere as a starting point. And each one, I think, I think Helen's, uh, you know, the, the, the guy that's available from from complying GDPR and from Helen's team is, is excellent for showing you the, the steps to go through. But the very first thing is, you've got to know how much data and where the data is that you've got on each person so that you can then do a risk assessment against each one and say that's a high risk of, of compromise or risk or sensitivity that's a low risk that's a no risk because yeah. you, you've got to do that that's going to be the very first step you do. and most people are shoving the head in the sand saying oh well i'll leave it till next year you've had a year already you've had, you've had more than a year. it was april 2016 when it was signed into the eu, EU stat, statute so you've had yeah. plenty of time to start now start Helen. yeah so um absolutely it's understanding your data um i apply gdpr do offer a free online uh, kind of GDP, gdpr readiness audit and that basically walks you through what you need to do it probably takes people about five minutes to go through it and i'm really happy to um, you know, offer that to anybody who's on the call who wants to to try that and just to give them an idea of what they should be doing. Great. So that's a good way of doing it. Another area where there seems to be a bit of confusion is um, the difference between candidate data and, and the company contact data. Um, so yeah. I've got a question here. Do we have to request consent from contacts to hold their data as well as candidates? So, um, well, cl client client data you would be holding because you have a, a contractual responsibility to actually complete the, the contract with them. So obviously you can't um, email your client and you can't phone your client if you haven't got their contact details. So, you know, it, it's kind of a kind of a, it's kind of a given that you would need that. Yeah. And it's the same um, with your staff that you, you know, need to have your staff bank details in order to pay them. So, you know, it's, it, 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 you don't need people's consent. But what, I think what people tend to forget is around <coughs> marketing, because the, the privacy and electronic marketing, you do need to consent to use people's data for marketing. And sometimes people think, oh, well, I've got my client's data, so now I can like bombard them with this, that and the other. That's where you need to start being careful. You need to get explicit consent for marketing. Yeah. Yeah, I think on the on the the client side, which is the right to do business, exactly. A lot of people will get birthdays. When's the birthday of the of the client contact person? That's sensitive information. So you've got to do a risk analysis and say, do we really need that? Are we, you know, because you've got to look at yes, it's not to send them flowers or to send you know, you know 
some wine or something on their birthday, but are you going to need to change that practice, remove that data so you don't have it, and then make a standard thing that you've got it Christmas or Easter or whatever is when you're going to do to all your clients so there's no individual identification of sensitive data. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Rob's asking about what about new business development then if you're sourcing companies that you want to you want to try and work with and you want to store their data. Public public domain information for most of these companies. So if you, you know whether you're looking in you know, yellow pages and that's still quite prominent over this side, but if you're looking at Zoom info, you're looking at all these public domain data sets. A lot of this information is out there is in the public. Yeah. Okay. As soon as you put and hold it in there, you're not compromising the data protection as long as you're using it as is and you're not editing it. It's when you start adding information yeah. to it yeah. about the person or about the individual, not the company, but the person and the individual. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I tend to think of it as kind of low risk, medium risk, and high risk data. So, um, things like, you know, if just somebody's name and their company and perhaps their sort of switchboard number is fairly low risk. Um, but if you then started, you know, finding out lots of information about them and sort of, you know, putting their birthdays and, you know, all the sort of kids' names and all this kind of stuff, that becomes high risk, particularly if you've got then, um, you know, passports or that kind of stuff as well. That's that's really high risk. But you've still got a responsibility to um, protect it because it's still data that you are responsible for, no matter as long as it, as long as you've got data that actually allows you to identify somebody that is classed as personal data, yeah, so you're yeah. still responsible for protecting it. But if it's really low low risk, then it's not such a big issue. So if you're if you're sitting here at the moment as an agency owner and you have fifty thousand candidates in your database, you've only been in touch with five thousand of them inside the past ten years. Um, as <laughs> May rapidly as May rapidly approaches, um, what, yeah. what advice would you give to those people? There's a great guy I know down in South End. You can do a da- data cleanse and a data migrate for you. Get rid of your forty five thousand and focus on the five thousand then start building up or screen, screen through if you've got time and money and energy, you know, the, the 45,000 that you haven't talked to, identify 10%, 15% and do a marketing campaign to them, the, the ones that you think are going to be valuable, but the ones that you haven't talked to for two, three, five, 10, 15 years, delete them, get rid of them. Yeah, absolutely. Find space that's not needed, and you're increasing your risk. All data is higher risk. Yeah, exactly. I think people start. People think about their databases as an asset, but actually, you need to start thinking about what what actually is a risk to me. And it was really interesting the other day hearing the ICO talk to recruiters about this. And the thing that they focused on was out of date data that they really, really don't like people holding data that's out of date and that's been collaborated with the lawyers we've been talking to too so you know you really that that is something that if you are picked up on it that they are going to look at so bear that in mind really really interesting we've been going through a couple of migration projects at our end um, recently as well where we're working with people during the migration process to look to clean up that that dead data and then exactly do what you said john you know market them market them out with some value and then drive them back towards the registration page where they can complete their details and update everything into the crm at the same time and then literally just look to remove the rest of those people as um if you don't get that consent Mm -hmm. so uh, great. So I'm. Um, I think we still have a few questions going on. <laughs> we could go on all night. Probably go on to later. But I think we'll, uh, I think we'll, we'll run till about five, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll stop. So um, I'm just trying to pick up some other questions on the right hand side. Yeah, there's one. There's one here from Dave Parney. He asked quite a good one about mobile numbers. Again, it's it's telephone numbers, and they are a medium risk. In, in, in my eyes, and the reason the medium is is if you've got a person's mobile or cell number, there's a chance that that will change as a change service providers or they lose the phone and have to get a new one and you know whatever. So in risk, but again, you're just looking at the data itself. It in itself is not sensitive because the chances are most people nowadays put, don't realise you can actually stop your phone number going out to the public domain, they just automatically fail to check the box that says, do not publicise my number. Yeah. Is that public? Fair game. That's actually low to no risk. Yeah, okay, cool. 
Um, and the best question of the crowdcast so far goes to uh, Richard. If we get raided by the feds, what do we need to confirm we have consent? <laughs> Just tell me it's like fake news because Donald Trump says so. <laughs> um, uh, so um, um, how can we get consent from the candidates uh, on our current database to hold their data? The ICO fined two companies a total of 83k for breaking the rule regarding marketing emails. Yeah. Okay. So I think just on, just on that marketing email thing, I think that was the Flybe and um, and Honda. So basically, what happened there? And this is around the, the privacy and electronic communication regulation. Um, they both had um, email lists where people had opted out, and they emailed everybody who had opted out and said, "Are you absolutely sure that you want to opt out?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess what happened? <laughs> they got reported to the ICO. So. It is it is an issue, and yes, it is true that people have been fined for trying to do the right thing. So the reason they were doing that was around the GDPR. So before you, I mean, just to go back to that sort of you know ten years worth of data, you kind of look at you know is it do these people know that they're on my database, and have I got the right to email them now asking them if they want to be in my database? So I think. You need to take a bit of a view on that because particularly if you're doing you know, large mailings, um, if people could complain about that, you could get reported, not reported under the um, existing privacy and electronic communications um, regulation. But I think if you're emailing candidates, is that really marketing or are you asking them? Because you're not trying to sell them a service. They're not trying to tell them your agency that you're going to pay a fee to, you're trying to help them get another job. So there might be a sort of, you know, an angle around that to think about. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, great. Um, Darren's came in and asked a good question here. So what, what, is the biggest risk? what is the biggest risk? Answering on a PSL tender contract, you have 5,000 accurate <laughs> records as you cleaned the 40,000 dead records or explained it to ICO why. <laughs> <laughs> no contact records are needed for legitimate interest. Love it. Uh, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question, Dan. Why are you on a PSL? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to invite you on to answer that one yourself. <laughs> right. so, um, so, guys, I think we will. Um, probably look to uh, wrap this up just now. Um, if anybody um, wants to um, ask either John or Helen any further questions after the Crowdcast finishes, um, they can go ahead and uh, and contact them. Both of them can be found on uh, on LinkedIn, obviously. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. you can get Helen on can buy GDPR um, on, the, yeah. on the website on there. Yeah, you can. Um, and we actually yeah. have a green button down the bottom here. It's about how to use GDPR to your recruitment agency's advantage, just at the on the screen here. Yeah. If you want to click that and come in and um, download that ebook that we've put together uh, with some some tips in there as well. Um, and if you want to speak to um, Firefish at all, give me a shout, guys. I'm always here to try and help and uh, chat in more detail about how we are handling um, GDPR as it approaches for our clients and our potential new ones as well. Okay. So. Um, thanks like very everybody. much everyone for coming on thank you so much for all of your time we really appreciate you guys taking yeah. the time to join us and uh, keep your eyes peeled for the uh, for the next uh, Firefish Crowdcast coming soon thank you everyone okay thanks thanks okay bye pleasure thank you bye yes.